Howdy, everybody. Okay, so we were just in the green room, and um, I was telling Pamela a little bit about how I've been on this slow journey towards uh, Young Earth creationism. So basically, I want to I want to give Pamela my 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 uh, the way I always viewed it was I always thought evolution was nonsense. So it just seemed nonsensical to me that all life could come from a, a like a primordial sludge because how could uh, survival of the fittest choose a, like genetics that aren't there yet? If it's just this primordial sludge, how can it choose the gene for an eye if an eye doesn't exist yet? So I always viewed evolution as pretty ridiculous. And despite believing in adaptation, right? Like, like you can see that creatures do adapt to their environment and maybe even change over time. But that's very different from, you know, species jumping and things like that. So um, we had Hugh Owen on a, about a month or two ago, and I had never really thought about young Earth creation. So I've, I'm kind of taking everybody on this journey of my conversion to young Earth creation, because over the past few years, I've realized that the people that tell you that a man in a dress is a woman and the people that told me that the vaccine was totally safe and effective and the people that tell me cow farts are heating the globe and the people that won't tell me that life begins at conception. These are the people that are telling me that we evolved from monkeys. So my distrust in them is very big. But I also don't want to just become skeptical simply because... I don't trust these people. So Pamela, you were telling me that you you actually did buy the evolution story for a very long time though, right? Yeah, I did. So I actually, um, I tell people sometimes that I became an evolutionist because of a creationist uh, biology textbook I used in high school. It was an Abeka um, textbook. It was printed by a Protestant group and the arguments that they presented against evolution, I really, um, I felt like they committed a lot of logical fallacies in the course of them, um, especially some just kind of some making fun of the evolutionists in a way that I just felt like was, you know, if this is their best argument, then then evolution must be true. And so I concluded that in high school. And then I went on to college and I studied um, cell and molecular biology in my undergrad. And then I got a master's in the, in the same and, you know, just kind of accepted that this was the way that things came to be and that really we did have some sort of solid, solid scientific evidence for it. And it wasn't until um, about 10 years ago now that I sat in a talk that was given by Mr. Owen, who is now my boss, um, that, uh, that I actually questioned that. And I, I questioned it for theological reasons, not for scientific reasons um, initially, although I already knew that you couldn't have um, absolutely materialistic evolution just because of the the complexity of the relationship between genes and proteins. So, you, know, you sort of mentioned earlier, you know, how could you how could you have a gene selected for for something that you don't have yet? But it's even more complicated than that because you have this this complex interdependence between the genetic information that's available in the DNA molecules and the proteins that are built using that information, but then they also have to build the coding molecules. So you have this, this sort of irreducible biomolecular chicken and egg problem. And I already knew that that existed. So I had to believe in theistic evolution. I couldn't believe in atheistic evolution. But then when I, when I saw what you have to believe about the character of God, particularly that you have to believe that he created through many, many, many millions of years of death, um, rather than believing that death actually entered the world through sin, um, I realized that I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I couldn't be a theistic evolutionist anymore. But I got a little bit hung up on the science because I thought that there was a lot of evidence for it. So I started looking, and the more that I looked, the less that I found, if you will. So, so we we were talking because a, a big part of the problem is that it's mainly Protestants doing this young Earth research and science and stuff because mm -hmm. catholics have kind of bought the myth that evolution is totally acceptable and you know it really all goes back to galileo where we have this deep internalized wound because galileo was right and we were wrong but really when you even look at that story it's not that the mm -hmm. church was wrong it's galileo was censured for other reasons it wasn't really that Plus, he was wrong too <laughs> Right, but it it's such a it's such a more complex story. So I actually I made the joke that you know you could kind of tell 
when you're to if you if you're talking to somebody that's a convert, you can kind of tell. So Nancy would be a prime example. So our friend Nancy <laughs> is a convert, but um, even she told us when we had her on. So Nancy, I'm not revealing anything she doesn't hasn't said publicly, but she was struggling with same sex attraction, and the Protestant view of that would be it's just sinful no matter what and when she heard the catholic understanding that the the, the desire and the temptation itself is not sinful acting on it is that that actually mm -hmm. helped her a lot so so the the like a big problem we face is that there's not a lot of philosophical depth to the protestant arguments yeah. so hearing things from a catholic perspective where hearing how owen uh, Hugh Owen described it where he said, really, their whole premise is based on that everything has been the same since the beginning. So in other words, when when they're dating dinosaur bones, for instance, they're not actually doing radiocarbon dating on it. They're finding where it is in in the levels of whatever Earth it is. And they say, well, the 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 conditions have been like this for millennia so you get this much sediment every year so we just deduce this is how far back into is that a fair assessment of that is that how they date dinosaur bones and things like that yeah it's a, it's a fairly fair assessment they do use um a different kinds of radiometric dating uh, besides carbon dating but those give you such long half-life ages that we can't really calibrate them effectively so carbon dating is the most reliable but then nobody does that on dinosaur bones because they think that the dinosaur bones are older than the limit of the carbon dating because the theoretical limit of the carbon dating is about 100,000 years. The practical limit when you're actually using uh, instruments that can't detect a single molecule is about 43,000 years. So nobody dates carbon bone except for my friend Hugh Miller or dinosaur bone. He actually carbon dated um, 11 different samples of dinosaur bone mm -hmm. and they came back with much younger dates than you would expect. They were well within that 43,000 year range. Um, they were in the 20 to 30,000 year range, roughly. And uh, he, he actually got a letter. I have a copy of it somewhere. Basically from, from the um, carbon dating laboratory saying, you know, we're sending your samples back and we don't really want any more from you because of your anti-scientific agenda, you know, and your conclusions about the age of the earth. So instead of actually saying, whoa, we're carbon dating dinosaur bones and they're only dating to 23,000 years. What's up with that? You know, maybe we should look into this. Maybe we should carbon date some more things that we think are older than, than, uh, than uh, you know, 43,000 years and see what happens. Um, they just said, no, we're not going to carbon date this stuff anymore. So what's funny about this is what really started me on this journey was watching this stupid Graham Hancock documentary, Ancient Apocalypse, or yeah, Ancient Apocalypse. And when he tried to challenge the dates of things, he got this crazy pushback and they accused him of being a racist. Now, he wasn't doing it from a Christian point of view. He was doing it sure. trying to prove that they were these civilizations. And mm -hmm. his whole narrative is that there was this ancient flood that wiped everything out. Now he right. won't say it's the biblical flood, but I mean, right. it's the biblical flood, you know? Right. So, but it just shows that there is this ideology behind what they, what they believe and they won't even allow their, their thesis to be challenged in any way whatsoever. So yeah. anybody that tries to challenge it gets this huge pushback and they claim you're being anti-scientific when that's not really what it is. So while we're, while we're on the subject of dinosaur uh, bones, because I never knew this until Hugh told us, but that they found soft tissue in dinosaur bones. So that when yeah. we spoke to him, it sent me on this whole rabbit ho rabbit hole on YouTube of just looking up soft tissue and dinosaur bones. Now, is it really just the one sample that that one that woman found, or is this found in multiple samples of dinosaur bones? Oh, there have been lots of samples of soft tissue found in ancient um, ancient bones, and then in ancient um, like uh, blood worms and things like that that are invertebrates. So uh, Kevin Anderson, who's got a PhD um, in, I think it's in paleontology, um, but he does research up in Hell Creek as well. He compiled uh, a couple of times. So he, he did an original book, Echoes of the Jurassic, and then he updated a second edition of it. He compiled a whole bunch of different examples of soft tissue found in dinosaur bones, as well as soft tissue found in other ancient uh, materials. So this is actually becoming quite common. Um, Dr. Mary Schweitzer was the first one to discover it because nobody was really looking for it because, you know, according to yeah, the, why, why would you? what we understand about bi biochemistry and, and the laws of physical decay, um, th it simply wouldn't be there if that bone was 67 million years old. So they found it by accident. And then at first she didn't believe it was really there. So she had her told her tech, we'll do it again. And then she said, well, I still don't believe it. We'll do it again. You know, so you can actually see her talk about this in the 60 minutes interview she did. 
which is just fascinating. And you can see they, they take these little tweezers and they pull on the tissue under the microscope and then they, they let go of the tweezers and it snaps back. Yeah. It's like it's elastic. elastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. That tissue is not. We, we have to, pl no we way. have to play this one clip because, um, Jimmy Aiken was on, he did a debate on pints with Aquinas with Gideon Lazar and Gideon Lazar had brought up the fact that there's soft tissue in dinosaur bones. And I want, I want to play Jimmy's response and just see, see what you think of how he responded to this. Rob, did I label it properly? You can tell which one it is. So um, to respond, I would uh, say that it, while it is surprising and it's an interesting and welcome discovery that there can be soft tissue in petrified uh, bones that uh, date to you know 70 or more million years ago that is unexpected but it doesn't actually give us reason to believe that they're young because soft tissue will remain soft tissue indefinitely if you i mean for millions of years if you isolate it from its environment so it doesn't have anything to interact with i mean if you put it in a freezer and uh in a vacuum and cut it off from it, from any other elements to interact with it's going to stay soft tissue forever and so the inference that you can draw is that in this hunk of rock that formed from a bone there was a pocket that was sufficiently cut off from its environment that we have a form of soft tissue left. Now that's unexpected, but it doesn't give us to reason to believe that this rock that formed from a hunk of bone is recent because we don't have good evidence for rocks being formed from bones by underground water leaching through them in just a few thousand years. You need longer than that to have petrification. <laughs> yeah, that, Jimmy Higgins sounds like Ben Shapiro's better. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I clipped. So, But it, it's almost like he's saying there was this pocket that was hermetically sealed away from its environment, but th that's pretty crazy to right. me. So he's never been to Hell Creek, Montana. So when they're digging up these bones, they're actually often um, saturated in water as they're digging them up. So uh, the idea that this bone could have been her hermet hermetically sealed um, from the environment is actually, that's already been a, a a theory that was put forward by researchers and was rebutted um, in the scientific literature. So unfortunately for Mr. Aiken, he didn't actually, you know, he, he, he came up with something on the fly that actually other scientists, you know, put forward to object to, to this, but it's already been debunked. So Plus he's claiming it would have happened, had to have happened to every single bone that these samples have been taken from. Right. And, and he probably didn't know at the time that, that, that he was dealing with, you know, many samples versus one sample, um, because that makes this hypothesis a lot less, a lot less tenable. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just that that hypothesis doesn't hold water. So they put forward a couple, um, they, they proposed that it was a bacterial biofilm. So Dr. Schweitzer herself, uh, disputed this and she said, well, I'm going to test for the presence of collagen, which is a protein that's only present in vertebrates. So she took some antibodies for collagen and they bound the tissue, which meant that it had collagen in it, which meant that it came from a vertebrate. So, you know, she proved it wasn't bacterial biofilm. And, and honestly, if you know anything about bacterial biofilms, it doesn't really look like a bacterial biofilm. They don't, they don't form structures that look like blood vessels or, or dendritic cells, but you know, that's okay. Um, and then uh, she, she came up with this theory that, you know, maybe it was the iron, it was the iron in the, in the blood cells that, that lysed and that that somehow preserved the tissue for 67 million years. So she did an experiment that lasted for about two years on her, her lab bench and extrapolated that to 67 million years. Now, if I had, were allowed to extrapolate my, my $2 to $67 million, I'd really appreciate that. But the, the banks don't like that very much. So, um, Unfortunately, her her experiment, while it showed that you could get some tissue preservation uh, over a period of two years with uh, things that were soaked in iron, you really can't extrapolate that to 67 million years. It's a, it's it's an inappropriate um, uh, use of your data. So I, I, I tell people sometimes I used to sit in um, in worm meetings at the NIH. So I used to work in a, a nematode lab up at Catholic University of America after I left, left the lab that I was working in on vaccines because they were using abortive fetal cells, I went over to the worm lab and we would sit in what they called worm meetings at the NIH. And there were scientists that almost came to blows over you know this much extrapolation on hmm. close to half a thousand data points. You know, and this is this is two years of data points and 67 million years of extrapolation. This doesn't fly in any other field of science yeah. other than evolution and cosmology. You're not allowed he, to make that kind of extrapolation. He's he's claiming, you know, he said that, well, of course, if they're hermetically sealed, that, that soft tissue can last for millions of years. But there's no proof for that except for the samples he's claiming. Right. Like, it just doesn't even make sense. Yeah, it's an after the fact explanation designed to explain 
an anomalous finding in, in keeping with the worldview, you know, which is the same thing that in the endosymbiotic theory is this idea that somehow the mitochondria is bacteria that was once upon a time swallowed by a eukaryote and it just didn't get digested. And now it's, it's symbiotically living with a, with a cell. And that's how we got eukaryotes. It just, it, it's, it's an explanation that's after the fact to explain something that they can't explain within their paradigm in any other way. There's no actual evidence that that happened. But since the explanation is done after the fact, there's, it, it's, you know, you can make it kind of fit the evidence perfectly. Yes, the logical fallacy, po po post hoc ergo propter hoc. Um, <laughs> so. so, okay, so we hear, we hear this all the time. We hear uh, our DNA is a 98% match to chimps. Now, I have a lot to it say just, about that. <laughs> it sounds wild to me when you when you when you hear that because they they they're they're almost programming you to think that like ch chimps are on the verge of of becoming evolving man. themselves to, to becoming human or something. Is there any truth to like what is the actual truth behind that 98% number? Okay. So the <laughs> there's a there's a lot of things I can say about that, and I will. So um the original 98% figure was based on your genes. So you have you ha your genes are 98% similar to chimps, um, roughly, or at least that was the original hypothesis. Now your genes constitute 2% of your DNA. So so far we're like 1.96% similar to chimps. So that's doesn't sound nearly as impressive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and then the original estimates that were given in, uh, in uh, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and then in Nature were that we were actually somewhere between roughly 4% and 13% different from chimps, which means that we're 96% similar or 87% similar, somewhere in there. Um, and what people don't realize is that even at only 4% different, that difference is 117 million base pairs. It's 117 million letters in our genetic code. And if you, to, that's a big number. So to put it in perspective, the average eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper holds about 4,000 letters. So it takes 29,250 pages to record all of the differences between humans and chimps. And that's more uh, pages than Father Ripperger has written in his entire lifetime. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, so, it's, so wait, but would you be like, how much in common would we have with a different animal? Well, 50% of your genes are, genes are in common with a banana. Okay. So you're, you're 50 percent similar to a banana. So that's your starting point. <laughs> OK. All um, right. So um, so these differences are are actually a lot more than people realize, even if we were at 96 percent similar. But we're not because those original estimates were based on the way that they sequence the chimp genome. So I actually used to work in the Genome Sequencing Center at Washington University in St. Louis, which is where they did the Human Genome Project. Now, I, I'm not old enough to have worked on the Human Genome Project. I worked on it after, uh, or I got there after they were, that had already gone to the computer programmers and they were, they were lining up the sequences that, that we'd, we'd created. So when you're, you're sequencing something for the first time, you do something called shotgun sequencing, where you take, cause you've got this 3 billion base pair stretch of DNA that's caught up into, you know, a number of chromosomes, but you, you take it and you cut it into about 2000 base segments and you just have a whole bunch of random ones from all over the genome. And then after you cut it up, you sequence them because 2000 base pairs is about as much as you can reliably sequence before it starts to become gibberish. And then you start overlapping them and say, okay, well, this one, this one must come before this one because they, they have this overlap area. And then th that's where the computer programmers came in and they just kind of lined everything up and, and then developed a sequence from beginning to end from chromosome one all the way to the, the Y chromosome. And so that's tedious and uh, time consuming, and it takes a lot of resources and a lot of manpower. And it took about 10 years for the Human Genome Project. So when they went to sequence the chimp genome the first time, they said, well, we know that humans are related to chimps. So we're just going to take that fully you know, uh, annotated human genome sequence, and we're going to line the chimp pieces up with that. Yeah. So it's the so exact sort of same fallacy from earlier. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, so they, they created a sequence that was more similar de facto because they, they actually aligned it with the human, the human um, genome sequence. So they actually had to go back and resequence the chimp genome in, in like 2016 or 2018. Um, and then, and then once they did that, they discovered that actually we're probably on the neighborhood of like 83 to 84% similar to chimps. And remember, 
You're 50% similar to a banana. Yeah. So that's not really that remarkable. Um, and the, the, the thing that, that kind of retarded genetics um, for a long time was this idea that the genes were what was important because the proteins are what's important. And, and that actually sort of makes sense, but it, it doesn't really quite work Just for the same reason that I can't give you a box of lab equipment and tell you to teach a chemistry class because you've got all the stuff that you need to do it with. So the proteins is all the, all the stuff that your cell needs to do everything, but your cell doesn't know just from the proteins when, when to make the proteins, how much of the protein to make, you know, where to make it. Cause you've got all that genetic information in every cell in your body and every cell in your body has to function in a different way. And since it has to function in a different way, you have massive amounts of regulatory information. So that whole 98% chimp myth came about basically because we thought the only thing that was important was genes for a really long time and that everything else was junk. Well, it turns out that everything else isn't junk. And since it isn't junk, we've got a lot of problems. One is that we're not actually as similar to other organisms as we originally thought we were. And the other problem is that the major mechanism whereby evolution is supposed to work, that of mutation plus natural selection, there's no room in your genome for the mutations that would have to occur in order to change one kind of animal into another kind of animal. Yeah, species jumping like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, I, I, one of the examples I used, I think, is like when, when they brought European hogs over to America over like a couple of hundred years, they developed tusks, right? Mm -hmm. So So you'll have like an adaptation within that species, but you'll never see that pig become a frog or, you know, you're yeah. talking about a massive jump there where genetic mutation, even, but that's part of the reason why they need to say these millions and millions of years also, because it needs to be over these incredibly long periods of time so that you can believe it's plausibility. It's not Right. Because you're just removing it from from a human's ability to comprehend it once you start saying millions of years, because we, yeah. we don't really understand a million. Um, yeah. We don't have a, a, a mental years. framework for that. Yeah. You know, I was I was at Tor Vergata in 2000 and, and, and for World Youth Day in Rome, and there were 2.2 million pilgrims at Tor Vergata. I, I don't have a concept of a million. And I was there. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, it, it's but, just wait. it's just a number that's bigger than we can understand. You hear you hear some of the things they say with such confidence and, and it it's really wild because they will make statements of of fact. There's there's a show on Netflix uh, uh, about life and they they create these uh, uh, computer generated images of what life was like five billion years ago, four billion years ago. And people will watch this and just take take so much for granted in that in the fable they're telling there like yeah. it is completely made up these people don't know anything about anything and they will just make it like they know everything and people will take that with such confidence as if it's a statement of fact yeah. so uh, rob let's play that one that other jimmy aiken clip because he talks about uh certain genetics that are in humans that he he deduces that we must have had ancestors that laid eggs or something. So I want to play this clip and then hear what you what you would say to, to Jimmy in this. Child had some blue eyed ancestors. Now, let's look at a problem that all species have when reproducing how to get nutrients to their unborn children. We humans solve this problem using placentas. A placenta is an organ that we develop as unborn children, but we don't keep our placentas. They fall off at birth. Placentas are temporary organs, like the tail of a tadpole. A tadpole's tail falls off when it becomes a frog, and a human's placenta falls off when it's born. What placentas do is allow us to get nutrients from our mothers. The placenta attaches to the mother's womb, and it gets nutrients from her body that allow the baby to grow. But not all species have placentas. Birds and reptiles lay eggs, so there's no way their babies can get nutrients from the mother's body after the eggs are laid. As a result, all of the nutrients the baby bird or baby reptile will need have to be stored in the egg itself, and that's the function of the egg's yolk. The yolk is a ball of nutrients that the baby will need to develop until it's born and can start eating with its mouth. So how do birds and reptiles make egg yolks for their babies? As you'd expect, this is determined by their genes. Birds and reptiles have genes that allow them to make a kind of protein known as vitelligenin, which is the main source of nutrients in an egg yolk. 
and the genes that control the production of vitelligenin are known as vit genes. Now, here's the thing. It isn't just birds and reptiles that have vit genes. Even though we humans use placentas rather than egg yolks to feed our unborn babies, humans also have vit genes. In us, they don't work because placentas, but we still have the genes. So what explains why humans have the genes to produce egg yolks like a bird or a reptile, even though we don't use eggs to house our unborn babies? It's the same reason that a brown-eyed child can have blue-eyed genes, even though they're not manifesting. A child with blue-eyed genes got them from blue-eyed ancestors, even though he's not blue-eyed. And since humans have genes for making egg yolks, some of our ancestors must have laid eggs, even though we don't do today. So that's his position. Geneticists can, have can, identified. So he's saying because we have the same uh, genes that, in us for laying eggs, our ancestors clearly is, had. Comparing that to blue eyes is such a wild logical jump. It's just unbelievable. Well, and it's God bless him. He's also just ignorant. Um, because a, a 30 second Google search would have told him that VIT genes have a function in human beings. They're part of our extracellular matrix. So like, <laughs> seriously, a 30 second search. So anytime you see claims like this, it's actually really important to, to go even to the internet and just type in, you know, VIT gene human, like, what does that do? It, it's, it's part of your extracellular matrix. And that's what causes your proteins to connect to each other. And there's no wonder that it's present in yolk because you have a lot of extracellular matrix that keeps that yolk together, right? So you're using a gene in a different way, a similar gene in a different way to perform a similar kind of function in the body. And this is, this is true of all kinds of genes that we share um, with, with bacteria that we share with bananas, right? So you have to live in an oxygen, an environment that's saturated with oxygen. So do they, you have to be able to deal with the free radicals that are, are produced when oxygen reacts with other things. So do they, you know, you have to, if, if you're something that metabolizes using oxygen, you have to be able to do that. And so, so does everything else that lives in an oxygen environment. So, you know, we have similar genes, but they don't necessarily indicate similar ancestry. They indicate similar functionality. You know, and I, I used to, I, I use a, a picture of these two chairs a lot that are, are super futuristic and weird looking. And I show them my presentations and I say, you know, do, do you guys know what this is? And everybody always says, yeah, they're chairs. And I said, well, how did you know that? And well, they have a back and they have a place to sit and they, they look like a chair. Even though you've never seen them before, you know that they're a chair based on the way that they're shaped. And the same thing actually applies to molecules. You know the function of a molecule based on the way that it's shaped. Um, and shape is super important. In fact, shape is, is the reason that the COVID-19 vaccines were tested on aborted fetal cells because yes. we ended up altering the, the, um, the DNA that was involved in producing the, the vaccine antigen so that it would maintain a stable three-dimensional shape, even in the absence of the viral particle. And then we had to actually produce that in cells. We didn't have to do it in aborted fetal cells, but that's what they chose to do. Um, but you have to actually produce that in a cell because you can't produce a protein in a test tube. It's too complicated. Um, and then look at that three-dimensional shape and say, hey, does this match the three-dimensional shape that we had when we actually had a virus particle? And it did. And then they went forward with vaccine production. So shape matters, shape on a molecular level. And, and it determines the function that that molecule can have. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that, you know, the, the, the vaccine and the virus had a common ancestor. So it, it, it means they have a common creator more than anything using the same tools, the same building blocks to solve the same sort of problems, just in different things. Right. Right. And there's a, there's a great book by Stuart Burgess. Um, I can't remember the title of it. It's sitting over there on my shelf and my eyesight is a little too bad to, to make it out. I think it's called the origin of man. Um, but he talks about elegance. So, so he's an engineer. So he's looking at, at, these similarities that you see in body plan and the similarities that you see in structure as an engineer and saying, look, there's a certain elegance to this. And there's also a certain functionality to this, you know, a, a crane and my arm and, and a cat's paw all have the same three joints. You know, I'm, I, it's, it's attached to the body at one joint, there's an elbow joint and there's a wrist joint. Um, because that is the most efficient way to build an arm. You know, and and there's also a certain elegance to all of creation, even down to the molecular level being built in the same way. 
um, because there's a beauty to it. There's a harmony to it. And there's, it's also beautiful because God designed creation to be known by man. And imagine if I had, if I started studying molecular biology and I had to completely relearn how molecules worked in, in a dog because they're different than the way they work in me, you know, that that's going to make that whole field unaccessible to, to human beings to study. So things are similar because humans need to have an understanding of the world and God made the world ultimately understandable. You know, so there's well, all kinds of reasons why things are similar besides common ancestry. Well, going going to uh, even to the VIT gene, right? It, mm -hmm. It's it's like, why would humans have this? Well, they for years, they told us that the appendix had no purpose. Right. And it, right. this is this is obviously evolution because the human being evolved beyond the appendix. And this is a leftover from evolution. And it turns out that the appendix actually does serve a purpose. And there is a really important. In fact, you might, you might die without it in your first couple of years of life. So, um, yeah. it, because it, it regulates the formation or the, the colonization of your, um, intestines by your microbiome and it regulates your immune function when you're little, it's part of the gut associated lymphatic tissue. So same thing with tonsils, the same thing with uh, it just uh, name an organ that they said was useless a long time ago. And, and, you know, I can give you a use for it. You know, yeah. um, my favorite one is actually ostrich wings, right? So ostrich wings are supposed to be le evolutionary leftovers because they're just somehow descended from a bird and they lost the ability to fly. No, they didn't have the ability to fly to begin with. Those wings are actually sophisticated air conditioning systems. So the way that the veins run through the wings in an, in an ostrich um, allows that ostrich to, when it, they flutter their wings, like you see them do all the time, they're cooling themselves off because they're, they're running cool air by all of that, that blood, um, those blood vessels that cools all that blood down, that cool blood goes back into the core. They don't overheat and die. Well, they live in the desert, right? So it's hot during the day, but it gets really cold at night. So at night they just tuck their wings up next to them. All those blood vessels stay right protected against their core and they don't cool down. They stay warm. And it acts it, as an insulator. It's just like elephant ears, <laughs> yeah. you know, for, for that, for that reason. Um, and the gentleman who just asked why he has a tailbone, um, that would be because it, you, you stand upright. Um, so the muscles that are involved in, in, in your legs, allowing you to stand, to maintain an upright posture and walk, um, are your tailbones involved in uh, the attachment of those muscles. It, when I when I listen to Jimmy Aiken, and I, and I like Jimmy Aiken, I don't want anybody to think I'm trashing Jimmy Aiken. I'm I'm bringing him up because he argues uh, for that position, right? And mm -hmm. um, it it seems as if he has a bias towards that position. And for me, what I've started to realize over the last few months is that I have a bias towards young Earth creation now, and and I want to have a bias towards it because the fathers were unanimous about a young Earth and all these things. So uh, where I'm at right now is. I am fully convinced that life uh, was created instantaneously by God when he when he does that in the act of creation. I'm still a little um, giving a little leeway to the age of the earth only because when God says on the first day this, the first day that God is not on the earth when he says that. So it's not maybe not a literal 24 hour day. Now it might be. And the more I research it, I might lean more towards that. But my bias is going to be towards leaning towards that seven day literal creation mm -hmm. because I want to be a faithful Catholic. And I want, so what the point I'm making is that we, we should have our bias towards that where obviously they have their biases as well. Right. And you see how much right. they use that. They give themselves so much Liberty that when something comes their way that contradicts it, they just shut it down and won't even hear it whatsoever. So yeah. Well, and come up with an ad hoc explanation. Um, you know, so you can, you know, I got asked at a, at a recent conference, you know, well, you know, you're saying that these people are biased in the way that they're looking at, cause it's reported, um, uh, you know, sort of over and over and over again in the literature and, you know, all this and that, it, but, but how, how, how would you defend against, you know, saying somebody saying that you have a bias and, you know, by the grace of God, I just looked at the person and I said, I have, I have no, um, no incentive to say any of the things I'm saying. Yeah. I will probably never work for another Catholic diocese as long as I live. Um, because they can Google my name and they can like this and they you're can say, radical. oh, she's a young earth creationist. Um, yeah, you're a radical. We don't, yeah, we don't really want to listen to anything else that she has to they say can, or anything. Google your name, but not the vid gene. Right. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> But it, but wait, just just hold on that for a second, because just think about how sure. preposterous of a state we're in in the church where if they Google your name, they'll see the things that you did during the pandemic and they'll see that you're a young earth creationist. And that will take the modern Catholic mind and make them like I, that is preposterous to me. And that's why I want to keep having these conversations, because as Catholics, they're like we're we're trying to stay where Catholics have always been. And it yeah. seems like. Catholic modern Catholics are just being dragged in this other direction. And there are some things about evolution that Catholics believe that you are actually going against like statements of, de of faith, like defeat a statements you're contradicting. If you don't believe Adam and Eve were two literal persons, that is very problematic. If people really think that, that, that the only thing that happens is that's when the human soul enters, you know, it, it, it's just very problematic in my, in my point of view. So uh, including well-known and what, what did uh, Gideon say, Rob? Many theologians have told me in private that they agree with young earth creation, but can't publicly endorse it for that reason. Yeah, it, it's, it's sad. I want to get the conversation going and I know we're a small show, but I, I think the people that listen to us should be exposed to hearing. You're not crazy for even looking into these things and don't let yeah. people that think the other way bully you into thinking you're an idiot for right. believing this stuff. Um, to, to get back to evolution, they're, they're constantly talking about the fossil record, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll show you a fossil record where it looks like there's this obvious progression through, well, it starts like this and then it evolves into this and they'll show you mm -hmm. these charts. And when I was listening to your talks today, because I, I, I listened to about five hours of Pam, Pamela Acker <laughs> today and I was riveted through all of it. I'm not kidding. Some of the audio is terrible on them, but yes, it was just amazing <laughs> to me to see how you broke down how ridiculous some of those charts are. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, back when I was an evolutionist and I saw the pictures in the book that, you know, that the, the humans are up here and the, the single celled organisms are down here. Right. I thought that if you dug straight through the floor, you would hit all of those layers that are represented in that image. And there's only about 5% of the places in the world where you can. So 95% of places in the world are missing millions of years of dirt. And nobody really can explain why um, using a, a standard you know, um, Lyellian framework where everything's just laid down gradually over, over eons of time. Right. And the other thing that they can't explain are fossils that show up where they don't belong. And there's a long history of us discovering, you know, fossils of, of more and more complex animals, deeper and deeper in the fossil record. We were just talking about this a little bit, you know, looking through telescopes, right. The, the further out in space you look, you should expect to see things, you know, if, if the universe is 13 billion years old, you should expect that something 13 billion light years away to look like nothing or dust yeah. you know so we were we were talking right. in the green room so i didn't i didn't want to bring too much of um <laughs> like astrophysics in because that's not pam's sure. area of expertise but i had asked her a couple of questions and we were talking about how you see light years into the past but i i, I didn't want to pin you with something that actually is in your area of expertise but that that is what pamela is referencing so but uh but if you look if you look at you know these these images that are supposed to come from 13 billion light years away you see fully formed galaxies and they can't explain that and the, they can't explain why at the bottom of the fossil record you find vertebrates so in the in the cambrian layer which is the 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 deepest layer where we actually find uh fossils it, there's something called they, they call it the cambrian explosion because there are over a hundred different phyla present in that um in that layer. So when you think about a phylum, you might have uh, flashbacks to a grade school class where you had to memorize kingdom phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, right? Um, but don't panic. It's not, it's not super complicated. So a species is one group of animals that uh, through the biological definition can interbreed with each other. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, technically a, a Pomeranian and a Great Dane are the same species, even though they look very, very different. Completely different yeah. Um, and then you have a genus, which is slightly, oh, there we go. We have a diagram even, um, slightly, a slightly broader category. A phylum is the broadest category that you can get within a kingdom. So a kingdom would be like, um, uh, animalia. So all the animals belong in one kingdom and a phylum would be all the different types of animals. So a jellyfish is going to be in a different phylum than you, than, uh, you are in, uh, in different phylum than a worm is in a different phylum than, um, uh, um, I'm forgetting my phylums because I'm on I'm on air live. Well, um, well, but would anyway. it be like a tiger and a lion? No, that's no. they're in the same genera actually. 
but um, they're not the same species. So but they're they, not the same species. So you, so, you can so crossbreed them, but then those are they couldn't phyla. interbreed, right? I think that's What's how that? that works. So like if you had a like if a tiger and a lion, you call that a liger, but then that mm -hmm. could not reproduce itself. Yeah. So ligers are are generally infertile. Um, I think there may have been an instance of one that wasn't, but I don't really remember yeah. if that was. I don't know why I saw one of the other species. Like, of that. Yeah, it gets <laughs> it gets complicated. Um, yeah, there we go. So uh, so we have some different phyla. So sea urchins are in a phyla. Um, snails are in a different phyla. Um, uh, worms, there are three different phyla of worms because worms are apparently that much different from each other. I wouldn't think that looking at them, but uh, insects are a phyla, sponges, um, and then of course vertebrates. So there are about 30 different existent phyla now, and there were about 100 different phyla in the Cambrian explosion. So we didn't go from one organism to a whole bunch of different organisms. We went from a hundred phyla to 30 phyla. Yeah. So the tree of life is really more like a Christmas tree, which is what we would expect um, from a creationist perspective. We would expect that God started with everything and then, and then things died out over time um, due to the fall of man, which introduced sin and death into the world. So um, could, could genetic entropy I was just going explain to explain that I, too. I, yeah, I wanted to make sure we all right. There's two things we have to talk about. I want to definitely touch on uh Pamela. Do you have a do you have a hard out or anything, or do you have some time to hang? I have some time to hang. Okay, so we got to talk genetic entropy. We have mm -hmm. to real I want to really talk about um carbon dating and okay. because that that's one thing that they're always throwing around. A couple of people in the comments are asking. Um uh Kennedy Hall is lame too though. So we'll <laughs> Kennedy, you should have watched, watched this whole show, man. <laughs> We love you, Kennedy. Yeah, well, Kennedy Kennedy is a, a big part of the reason I'm even tackling some of these things because sure. a lot of the conversations him and I have been having are, uh, I think evolution is a very big divide between modern Catholics and traditional Catholics where there has to be a conversation had where I just, I feel like too many modern Catholics are just easily falling for the evolutionary thing. And there's a lot of implications that come with evolution. It's, it's, it's meant to make you feel insignificant. A lot of it has to do with it is simply a creation myth. Every yeah. culture, every human culture that has ever existed in the history of man has always wanted to know where they came from. So when you see these temples throughout the world, these are all these different cultures trying to understand where they come from. And modern man is no different. And in order to get rid of the Christian Genesis story, they had to come up with a new one in order to replace the religion of Christianity. So, right, right. Um, and the new one turns man into a beast and God into a monster. That's crazy. Oh man. So, okay. So genetic entropy, what, what actually is genetic entropy? Because it, I, I remember uh, talking with Hugh Owen a little bit about it and it, it mm -hmm. almost, I, if I remember correctly, it would, it would suggest that it's, it, it means that evolution actually could never work because of genetic entropy. Right. I, I forgot right. how he explained that. Right. So um, I touched on one of the tenets of it a little bit earlier when I was talking about there's just no room in the genome for the kind of uh, mutations that you would need to go from one species to another because you have all that regulatory information. Um, so which is sort of like having all the lesson plans for a chemistry class. You got to have the equipment, but you got to have the plans too. You got to know when everything's going to be deployed. Um, and the same is true in your body. So you have all this regulatory information in your genome. So if all or most and of your genetic information is useful. If you have a change in that genetic information, that change is de facto going to be bad for you. It might not be so bad for you that you die, um, but it might be just a little bit bad for you, sort of like losing a few pennies on a transaction, right? So um, basically the concept of genetic entropy, which was developed by Dr. John Sanford, who um, also invented the gene gun because he was uh, genetically modifying plants back almost before it was cool. Um, he, uh, he looked at uh, population genetics uh, over a lot of time uh, it, as that field had developed. And he just basically said, look, um, you know, what we see over time and what he saw experimentally in the laboratory was that as we increase mutations, we decrease fitness. So the more mutations that you accumulate, the less fit that you get. And you can think about this when you, if you use an analogy, right? So if your genome, you can think of as an instruction manual, because it's hard to sort for people to sort of visualize three, three and a half billion base pairs. What does that even mean? You know, but it's all the instructions that it takes to build you. Now, if I pick a random page and I add a random mistake on that page, it might not make a huge big difference to the instruction manual. 
but I have to copy the instruction manual from my parents who had to copy it from their parents who had to copy it from their parents who had to copy it from their parents. So every time a copy is made about a hundred mistakes get introduced. So my parents made a hundred mistakes. I'll add a hundred mistakes to their hundred mistakes. My children would add a hundred mistakes to my hundred mistakes and my parents hundred mistakes. And do you see how this like yeah. builds over time? Yeah. Um, so you might have a mutation that's not very damaging in the short term, but when you combine it with other mutations that are not very damaging in the short term, you get mutations that are very damaging in the long term. And it's like how you end up eventually with the new American Bible. <laughs> that's funny. Um, well, uh, okay. So what, what, <laughs> what I'm, what I'm, what I'm getting from you is, okay. So what would seem to contradict this is that life expectancy seems to be going up, but in reality, that's just because medical technology has gotten better. Cause it seems like what you're saying, it might even give a little bit of an explanation for why people were able to live 900 years mm -hmm. early yeah. on in the, in the old Testament, right? You hear Noah lived right. 900 years, things like that. So right. it's, a, it's almost like the, the longer time goes on, human beings are actually receding these uh, certain qualities about their genes that, would give them longevity even, right? Yeah, yeah. So you have a certain inflation of life expectancy from now to now versus like 100 years ago or 200 years ago. But you have to sort of understand what's going on in human history at the time, right? We have almost zero infant mortality now. Um, although we have the highest rate of infant mortality among developed countries, you know, so maybe we should ask the CDC about that one. Um, oh, we do but, in America, huh? Yeah, we have one of the highest oh, rates wow. of infant mortality and maternal mortality, I think. Um, so, it, but it has it doesn't have abs it has absolutely nothing to do with with uh, you know things that we we stick into children the day that they're born. Um, yeah, I was gonna so, say this is, sounds like a conversation Robert uh, uh, RFK Jr. might be having <laughs> because that, that even look as wacky as he is on certain topics, a lot of the things he's talked about with the medical issues yeah. have really and everybody in the comments pamela has been saying you were unbelievably helpful during the pandemic so i don't know Thanks i don't know if you're that. able to see but everybody in the comments is like pamela helped me so much during the pandemic so well, well, i want to make sure i i yeah. i every time i meet somebody who says that you know i i chose not to compromise because of something that that you said it's it it makes everything that i i go through to do yeah. this so so thank you too Everybody who's saying that it made a difference. That um, okay. So now with <laughs> radio car uh, carbon dating, right? So, um, oh, I, were we done with genetic? Oh no, no, no. If you have more, please, please keep going. I, I cut you off. I'm, I tend to do that sometimes. I'm a little scatterbrained. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> no, no, no. You're good. So, um, but basically, uh, you know, the lifespan inflation from a couple hundred years ago has, has a lot to do with um, sanitation. It has a lot to do with uh, lack of infant mortality. It has a lot to do with in improved medical care for geriatrics. It has a lot to do with the fact that we just don't work as hard. We don't live as hard lives anymore. We don't, mm -hmm. we're not working 14 hour days in the mines, yeah. you know, so you don't have, you don't have people, as many people dying from accidents. You don't have as many people dying from um, being weakened from malnutrition or their bodies just wearing out. Right. So that doesn't really mean that we're living longer, healthier lives. And if you look at people, the amount of chronic disease that is present in our population now is unreal. It's off the charts. You know, so that I think, too, is evidence of genetic entropy that we're, we're gradually genetically decaying over time. And I'm going to make another politically incorrect statement here, because obviously that's that's an acceptable thing to do on this channel. That's um, our favorite. But <laughs> yeah, we, please, uh, go ahead. We <laughs> rapidly accelerated genetic entropy in the human race when we introduced birth control. Um, into yeah. the population because when a woman chooses her mate while she's taking birth control, she is going to choose a mate who is too genetically similar to herself. And if she chooses a mate who is too genetically similar to herself, then their children are not going to be as healthy. And this is particularly in regard to the immune system. So the what a, a woman, um, so they're they're uh, pheromones that that humans give off that actually help in mate selection. And what a woman is picking up on is actually a man's MHC class two molecule, which is a molecule that's present on your immune cells. And if she's not on birth control, she's going to be attracted to a man whose MHC two is very different from hers. And if she is on birth control, she's going to be attracted to a man whose MHC is very similar to hers. So 
Well, Jordan now- Peterson. Jordan Peterson just had some, a woman on, and mm-hmm. she's by no means a, a Christian, even I don't think. But she was talking about how women on birth control will meet someone, fall in love with them, and then later on go off birth control, and she's repulsed by him. Yep. And th- it's just what birth control does to a woman is yep. messes up her it, pheromones. It flips and- the switch of of the physical attractiveness yeah. to someone that they wouldn't normally be attracted to. Yeah, it's crazy. And every young girl that goes to her first OB appointment is being pushed to mm-hmm. take this stuff. Oh, you have um, acne here. Take some take some birth control. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. But my, oh, your my... period's not regular? Oh, I'm sorry. No 14-year-old's period is regular. Like, yeah. <laughs> don't put her on birth control. It's so it's so crazy because my daughter had to go for her first appointment and mm-hmm. they tell the doctor, the doctor tells my wife immediately, you have to leave the room so you can talk to your daughter. Whoa. And she she talks to my daughter and then the, my, my wife comes back in and she goes, well, she tells me that she tells you every single thing and she's not active in any of those areas. So she's not, you know, I'm like, the, wow. these psycho doctors just want to pump yeah. these kids full of things at 14, 15 years old. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's really um, yeah. So uh, was there anything else on genetic entropy or? Yeah. It, well, so just that. Um, you know, renowned population geneticists have noted that there's a, an overall fitness decline in the human population as much as 5% per generation. And 5% per generation means that the human race is going to die out from bad genes in not very long. So, wow, that's, that's like, consistent. that's like, even, even if we don't blow ourselves up in about <laughs> in a couple thousand years, you're going to have like a 20 year lifespan. Yeah. If you came, well, if you came here for long, a white bill tonight, guys, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> long, long before that, we're just going to lose our fertility and we're not going to be able to reproduce. That's the yeah. first thing that's going to be affected, I think, in terms of, of, of that. But I have every confidence that Christ will come again before we get to that point. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the wonderful things about being a Catholic mm-hmm. <laughs> is that we know we win in the end. It's just right. going to be a little bumpy road on the way. Um, sure. Okay. So, <laughs> so. Um, with radiocarbon dating, because you, uh, I think pe- the, the majority of people assume that carbon dating is how they could tell something is millions of years old. But the reality is, is that is a, is a, I think a half-life of what, like around a hundred thousand years in, in carbon? No, well, it's, it's a half-life of about five, five and a half thousand years. And then oh. the limit of detection is about a hundred thousand years. So by a hundred thousand years, you would have zero molecules of radioactive carbon left. But you were saying okay. most labs can only detect up to about 40,000. Yeah, they'll say, theor- theoretically, the limit is like 50,000, but they'll say like 42, 43,000 just, just to protect their their um, you know reputation, you know, yeah. so that they're, they're not claiming dates that they're not confident about. Okay. So it is, if you get a clean sample, it would be, it, theoretically, it's accurate because you know uh, carbon dies out at a certain rate and but what, what would we say currently right, dies out at that what rate. would we say about if something has a forty thousand you know if carbon has a forty thousand year uh you know detectable like what would we say to 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 if we if we only are if we're claiming that the earth or that life is only about ten thousand years old nine thousand years old what like what is the answer for how that would be that long sure so how did how did the dinosaur bones date to twenty to thirty thousand years? Right. Ago? Yeah, exactly. Thousand years old. Um, so there's a couple of reasons. So there's a, a couple of assumptions that are made anytime you're using radiometric dating. And one is that you know the starting concentration of the um, parent molecule and the daughter molecule, right? In the case of radioactive carbon, the daughter molecule is nitrogen, so we don't measure the daughter molecule because there's there's so much nitrogen in the atmosphere anyway, we wouldn't be able to measure the difference from the radioactive decay of carbon. We measure the radioactive carbon, but we assume that we know how much radioactive carbon was in that organism when it died. Okay. okay. We assume that the amount of radioactive carbon in the atmosphere at the time of the death of dinosaurs is the same as the amount of radioactive carbon in the atmosphere now. And there's a couple of reasons why we shouldn't assume that. One is that the, the amount of radioactive carbon in the atmosphere right now is not at equilibrium. So equilibrium means that you have you have um, change, you have decay, and you have creation of radioactive carbon at the same rate, right? If the decay and the creation are not occurring at the same rate, you do not have a stable amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Is it so, currently increasing or decreasing overall? That's a great question. And because I'm really bad at true-false questions, I don't retain 
okay. myself like that. Uh, so if it's one or the other, I'm going to be like, oh, I think it was this, but I don't really remember. Um, okay. So I just remember we're not at equilibrium. So, um, so if we're not at equilibrium now, there's no reason to assume that we were at equilibrium in the past. And there's no reason to assume that the current amount of carbon-14 that we find present in the atmosphere is the same as the amount of carbon-14 that was present when the dinosaurs died. And the carbon-14 is going to be affected by the, uh, mag the strength of the Earth's magnetic field because it's created um, from cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere. So if the magnetic field is stronger, then there's going to be less carbon-14. We know that the magnetic field was stronger in the past, right? So, or, or if solar activity for a period was higher sure, or lower, right? that could affect yep, it too. Okay. Absolutely. So if there was less carbon-14 in that dinosaur when it died than I think there was, it's going to date to older than it should. Right. Okay. So that's one thing. The second thing is I have to assume that that's a closed system, that nothing ever came into or went out of it. Right. Now, if I cover the entire earth in water, water leaches everything. Yeah. Okay. So if water leaches some of that carbon-14 out of that bone, that carbon, that bone is going to have less carbon-14 than I think it should. It's going to date older than it is. Right. So that's another right. problem. And then the other problem Rob actually referred to a second ago, which is basically that we assume that the amount, the um, rate of radioactive decay is constant over time. Um, and we don't have any way of knowing that the radioactive decay is constant beyond the, yeah. the amount of time that we've been able to measure it. <clears throat> right. So, um, and, and we have actually examples of things that we know the date of, and we know the age of, we know when something was formed or when something died. And we radiocarbon date or um uh, uh it's not carbon dating but it's um radiometric dating we radiometrically date uh, lava rock for example and it dates to completely wrong ages there are many examples of this uh in the scientific literature yeah. so the dating itself is not infallible for a number of reasons because it's based on three assumptions that we know actually don't hold very well so, all right, you, uh, what'd you actually major in when you went to school? Like what, what did you actually go to school for? Cell and molecular biology, but I okay. had an interest in biochemistry and my, my research, uh, that I did in graduate school was in, in vaccines and then genetics. So while you're going to school for this, um, what is, the, what, what is the school stance? Is the school stance that they're teaching you this, uh, presuming that evolution is true oh yeah um i mean i had to take an entire semester of evolution in my undergrad just to make sure that i understood how it worked you know um so and, well, and even would, when i was you would want to know their their right you do want to know where they're claiming like where they're making their claims for that's the best way to refute their arguments too i would guess yeah but i don't really you know i i mean this was like 20 years ago but i don't remember being given actual evidence from like research or or i don't remember reading journal articles i just remember being told like this is it was, how it works it was indoctrination put it back to me yeah i mean it, i didn't read real journal articles until i was in graduate oh so wait you know? so you so, so you went so you were an evolutionist while you were in college for this stuff mm -hmm. yeah oh okay so i was thinking that you okay so you weren't even really pushing back on any of the things that seemed kind of wacky at the time or... no not till not, when i got to graduate school i was still i was still i would still have called myself an evolutionist but i was very much like a but you guys understand this can't happen like by itself right like yeah. you really understand this can't happen by itself um and i i didn't have as much stuff come up in class then because because by the time you get to graduate school you're dealing with real science which means yeah. you're not actually talking that much about evolution even though it's referenced in just about every paper that you read you, you know you'll you, there'll be some connection to the evolution of this or the evolution of that you know and this this is this way because it evolved you know da 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 da, da whatever um but uh you know but you just kind of skip over that and you actually read the 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 um actual data when you're trying to analyze it for for a class but you know they're they're so i didn't i didn't have an opportunity to really push back much about it in graduate school anyway i was kind of also busy pushing back about the aborted fetal cell issue and that was yeah. that was about all i could handle at the time um so uh That's so crazy so you because you're a cradle catholic we, we mm -hmm. were 
we were bonding over our <laughs> our uh, cradle Catholic. Because it is kind of funny. You can always tell a convert through their language, and the, they bring they bring a Protestant ethos into the Catholic sphere, which I love. My Protestant. If convert. they mention the Bible every couple of minutes, convert. <laughs> Guarantee it. <laughs> or, or if they're constantly talking about the Church Fathers, like Joshua Charles is constantly about the Church Fathers, trying to <laughs> try to explain to everybody why I came to this crazy place that you all think we worship statues, um, but. So I don't, even know I, I don't know. I know. I know some cradle Catholics who talk a lot about the church fathers. So, yeah, <laughs> well, well, that's what a good that? thing. Right. But I just snorted. All yeah, right, so, I heard that. <laughs> uh, there's um, probably an evolutionary reason for that. So. Um, so your upbringing, like you, you had never left the faith or anything, right? You not, you didn't have like a reversion. Yeah. You actually kept your faith throughout this entire process. By the grace um, of God. <laughs> Yeah, well, me and Rob talk about that too because I was cradle Catholic. I never, there was never a time where I didn't believe in God, but there was some, mm -hmm. there was a period where I lived as though God didn't exist. I was, even though I was I a never, really bad Catholic for a while. Yeah, very, yeah. very Catholic, so, um, but well, yeah, that really is amazing. So, about how long ago did you start coming around on this? About 10 years ago. So I was teaching at the time at a, an all boys school in Richmond, Virginia. And my uh, colleague, Billy Doran was, um, you know, he, he attended the Latin mass. And at the time, at the time, I was the sort of person who looked at him and said, well, my, what makes you think you're more Catholic than the church? Um, <laughs> so, now you're one of those radicals. It's great. <laughs> well, you know, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm pleased to attend any mass that our Lord is pleased to attend. Yeah. So there are certain ones that I won't go to. And Others that I will happily go to and the, the choices I make would surprise some people. So, um, but uh, he, he was just very insistent, you know, that, that, um, that, you know, I needed to go to this talk that this, this Hugh Owen guy was giving at, at the, at the TLM church. And I was like, well, in the first place, this is at the TLM church. And in the second place, like, I, I'm not interested in evolution from a theological perspective. It's not a theological question is what I thought at the time. Right. So I went the next day to hear Dr. Joseph Strada give the talks that I now give <laughs> when, when Mr. Owen travels and gives a weekend seminar. So, um, so, you know, I was so excited by what he was saying because he was not only saying things that I had already thought, but of course, none of my colleagues would confirm or discuss with me. He was saying things that I didn't even know that I was like, oh, that also means that evolution couldn't have happened by itself. That also means that evolution couldn't have happened by itself. And then because I'm, I'm primarily phlegmatic in my temperament, which surprises a lot of people because of, of the public persona that I have. Um, but inertia works for you and against you. So I was already there. So I just didn't leave. So yeah. I listened to Mr. Owen's last talk. And in his last talk, he talked about the character of God and basically what you have to believe about the character of God, you know, and, and that was, that was when I turned around because until I understood that the way that understood in a, a super concrete way that the way that God created the world reflects on who God is. And then if God created the world, the way that he said he did, that he created it perfect. He created it for us. That said something that, that was the God that I believed in. I didn't believe in a God that was going to create through millions of years of death. I didn't believe in a God that was going to create an imperfect world. And somehow through, through struggle and strife and, mutations and you know it just horrific dead-end existences of of these organisms that just didn't make it was going to somehow bring you know adam and eve out of that like that no that's not how that works yeah um so that's really what turned me around i mean i i had already i already understood that evolution couldn't happen by itself so i already sort of saw some of the scientific flaws with it but it was ultimately the theology that 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 convinced me that the worldview itself was bankrupt. And then for a little while, I was afraid to look at the scientific evidence because I thought that there was a lot of scientific evidence for evolution. And then I started really digging into it. And I started, and I have spent years now doing this, probably eight years, um, looking at supposedly beneficial mutations, looking at, you know, every objection to genetic entropy that you could think of, looking at the, the, the soft tissue and the dinosaur bones. And, and it's just, it is amazing how much evidence is inconsistent with the theory of evolution. When you actually look at what's being done in the laboratory and what's being reported in the scientific literature, it's just absolutely inconsistent with, with this idea that you could have gone from 
first for, in the first place, it's more impossible to go from chemicals to a cell than it is from a cell to a human being. Yeah. But even just from a cell to a human being, it's it's actually biologically impossible. What, so, what about what about actual hominid skeletons, uh, like uh, uh, fossils? Because you hear all the time about Neanderthal. Like, mm -hmm. are there complete fossil records of these other hominids that? Because I mean, they're always they were always looking for the missing link, and there have been several yeah. times where they pretended they had the missing link, and it was really just faked and put together and stuff. But yeah, are there actual? Are, are the, were those just ape creatures that went extinct, or what? 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 What, what is that? Yeah. So, so um, John Wynn, who's worked really closely with the Colby Center and runs um, Restoring the Truth Ministries, uh, has a book called The Fall of Darwin's Last Icon. And he also has a book called A Catholic Assessment of Evolution Theory. And the Catholic Assessment of Evolution Theory deals with um, the human evolution question in an appendix. And Fall of Darwin's Last Icon deals with it towards the end of the book. Um, and I think he's got an even shorter book just on human evolution. But he has gone through all the literature and looked at what's being discussed in terms of human uh, and ape intermediates. And he's concluded, and I think he's concluded rightly based on, because I've looked at his evidence backwards and forwards, helped him review some stuff, you know, and uh, he's, he's shown pretty conclusively. And then actually Christopher Roop and John Sanford also wrote a book called Contested Bones, where they demonstrate basically the same thing. And that the two of them did it independently. Um, that when you look at the literature you what you have are either apes or men mm -hmm. there's there's no ape men and so neanderthals are men they're they're slightly malformed men but they are men right and so, so wait neanderthals, neanderthals are human yeah okay all yeah. right wow i see so i would have thought i would have thought they too. were okay so they were so you they were malformed so you think like are there multiple examples of them or yeah, so some some fossils we have many 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 examples of, and some some we don't have as many examples of. Um, so there's a there's a paper from Nature that that talks about um, Homo sapiens. That's us Homo sapiens morphology versus Homo erectus morphology, and Homo erectus is the one that's supposed to have come before Homo neanderthalensis and a couple other Homos. And 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 this was Nature. So Nature <laughs> is like the the book of biology. Yeah, it's like the quintessential. You know, if you yeah. get published in nature or published in science, you have like made it. Um, so, so they listed seven different reasons that, that a man could look like a, an ape man, basically. So homo sapiens could look like a homo erectus. They said inbred communities, um, nutritional problems, anemia, genetics, uh, hormones, uh, disease, um, and even just the fact that natural variation in bone thickness would result in denser bones being more likely to be preserved than less dense bones. So there's all kinds of reasons that you can get, you know, different human morphologies. And, and we have a hard time conceptualizing this because we see all the images, right? You have the guy, the apes becoming the men. Yeah. But just think for a minute about if, if you buried Danny DeVito and Shaquille O'Neal. I was just going to say, I'm not even kidding. I was just <laughs> going to say, if if you found Shaquille O'Neal's, you know, yeah. body a, a, a thousand years from now, a thousand years later, you would think there was a race lot. of giants. Yeah, that you would think that they were different species. That's so, really, it's so crazy how much they infer from a mm -hmm. couple of bones. That it, it's yeah. Well, and it's it's kind of not surprising when you consider human nature because you know, there's, there's a thirst for, well, I want to be the one who found the, mm -hmm. you know, the missing link, but there's also a thirst for grant money, you know? So I'm not mm -hmm. going to get any more grant money if I just found another human bone, especially if not, if I found a human bone in a strata where it's not supposed to be, you know, that, that means that humans were alive a really long time ago, you know, way back before they were supposed to have been alive, you know? Or like um, footprints with dinosaur bones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So yeah, there's there's cave drawings of perfect Stegosauruses at, yeah. at a time before they ever discovered any. There's one carved in a temple in Cambodia from like somewhere between the 9th and the 12th centuries, which is long after mm -hmm. dinosaurs were supposed to have been extinct and long before we're supposed to have dug them up. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's uh, when you, when you really start to understand how much of their imagination goes into these things. Um, it really is. It, 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 it's almost like I can't watch anything 
with science anymore from the mainstream because anything they say, like all I did, like uh, recently there was an article that came out about this bear they found in Russian permafrost. And they're like, this bear is this ancient prehistoric bear from 80,000 years ago. And, and like two weeks later, somebody's like, no, never mind. This thing's only from 7,000 years ago. We made a mistake because, because they want it to be this thing, yeah. this ancient thing that existed in their minds, you know? Right, right. And and we have to understand that, like, you know, science, it, and, and this always confused me as a kid, you know, the first thing that you do in science is you come up with a hypothesis, which is basically a prediction about what you think is going to be the outcome of the experiment. And then you design the experiment. So you're, you have all kinds of selection bias because you're designing yeah. an experiment to look for the thing that you're looking for. And not necessarily to look for the truth. And so that's just, it's just a problem that's rampant in science these days. People are so conditioned to just look for the things that they're expecting rather than looking for the things that they actually find, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever I see a, an article or like a tweet or something that says this thing is from 45,000 years ago, or this is from 3 million years ago, they may as well just say a bajillion like, like right. you may as well just make up some number because once you get into that realm of millions of years, you really can't comprehend it. Like we no. were saying earlier, you just, yeah. it just, it's just this thing from ancient past that we'll never understand. And right. And if you make it hand wavy enough and you assert it forcefully enough, then everybody's going to be like, Oh, okay. I don't really understand how that works, but you must, you know, it must be true. Yeah. Um, I had a question from uh, from somebody asked me, uh, what is the difference between evolution and adaptation, if there is any? Mm -hmm. And what role does food, weather and radiation like from sunlight play in the alterations to DNA? Sure. So um, those are kind of two separate questions. So you have to yeah, two separate remind questions. me of the second one after I answer the first one. Well, the one. first one was just uh, what's the difference in evolution and adaptation? Right. So some people try to call it, make a distinction between macroevolution and microevolution. I prefer to make a distinction between evolution and between variation within a kind. Right. So um, if you look at dogs, dogs are a great example of how far we can push variation within a kind because you have all kinds of variation in terms of coat length and coat color and tails and ears and size and, you know, and even friendly versus not very friendly. Um, you know, but you don't ever develop a dog that has opposable thumbs and there's never a dog that gives birth to kittens. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you have organisms have in their genes an ability to vary within certain parameters. And one of the clearest examples of this is actually Darwin's finches. Um, they were studied by Rosemary and Peter Grant um, on, on the Galapagos islands. And they looked mm -hmm. at the finches over the course of a drought and uh, as the, the water decreased, the seeds, the, the only thing, food that was left was super dry, big seeds from previous seasons. And the birds that had larger beaks survived and they said, look, you know, this is evolution happening. These birds have bigger beaks than they had before, but then the drought went away and the average beak size decreased because the birds had the ability to produce slightly larger beaks, slightly smaller beaks. And the ones that would survive would depend on what the environmental conditions are. So that's that's where you get adaptation because natural selection is a thing. Yeah. So if all of a sudden, you know, the environment changes and a certain kind of trait is not favored, the individuals with those traits are going to die off. But that's yeah, you going breed to two big dogs, you're going to get big dogs. You breed mm -hmm. a chihuahua with, uh, you know, that's why you get these, uh, you know, different different breeds of dog you'll get different sizes and variations so but wait now with the finches because i remember arguing with somebody about this one time and he was trying to tell me that you the finches arguing? were actually different species so well there's supposed to be 14 different species but if you use the biological definition of species which is animals that can interbreed are the same species then there is at most six different species and there might be only one different species so um the the Darwin's finches, the, the 14, 14 different species don't interbreed because they're on separate islands, but mm. not because they're actually different species. So you can mm. have geographical isolation and, and then you get, you get changes in traits like beak shape or, or even uh, foot shape or feather uh, coloration or things like that. Because when you have a small population that's isolated from another small population, anytime you have a small population, if you have a single mutation arise, it's more likely to get fixed in that population. It's more likely to stick around. And if you have some sort of event like a drought, 
or a flood or something that's going to eliminate a lot of the population sort of non-specifically. Um, although a drought would be a little bit more specific, but it, it, a forest fire, you know, a forest fire doesn't care whether you have a big beak or a small beak. It's if you're in the way, you're just going to yeah. get burned up, you know? So that causes genetic drift, which will cause the loss of certain genes from the genome that might actually be favorable to the organism. But just because those individuals happen to die that day, they are no longer in the gene pool. So when you, when you look at natural selection and adaptation, you have to remember that whenever you have uh, change in a population like that, you usually have loss of genetic information. And that goes back to the problem of genetic entropy, right? A Chihuahua will never give rise to a Great Dane because a Chihuahua has lost the genes for long, well, Great Danes don't have long fur, but it's lost the genes for size. Chihuahuas have mm -hmm. lost the genes for long hair, right? Mm -hmm. They don't get them back unless you breed them back with something that has longer hair. Yeah. You know, once you've lost something, you can't just get it again. And, and that's ultimately this, 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 the real story of genetics. It's a story of loss, um, of winnowing, of sifting, um, of culling. It's not yeah. a story of building up information and, and taking something very, very simple and making something much more complex. I, I think I remember, uh, I think I, I, this is like a, a vague memory of mine, but I think Darwin said when you breed incestuously you get these changes more dramatically quicker which would kind of mm -hmm. go back to your neanderthal theory right mm -hmm. <laughs> where if you're yeah. you'll get these strange defects uh, whether, yeah. whether they're defects or something else if you're inbreeding you'll mm -hmm. get these strange mutations that will come up yeah you can get what looks like new body plans but really it's just deformed well body yeah. plans. it's like a uh, homo florensis and like uh, mm -hmm. papua new guinea they appear to be this like dwarf hobbit separate human species but if it's just uh, a previous human population that got isolated mm -hmm. in a very s small island uh, they would just adapt or like yeah. like you said maybe the the tall ones got killed off somehow and yeah the, well, on the shorter ones were all that's left advantage to being smaller because you don't need to eat as much it's like japanese sitka deer and stuff like that yeah Hey, why do some humans have, um, like, I, I mean, I'm, I, I hope this doesn't come off wrong, but like, oh, why, no. would, why would oh, Asians' no. eyes appear a certain way? Like, is that really just because of, uh, I mean, I would think skin color has to do with um, just being exposed to sunlight and melanin and things like that, right? But like, why, what, the, the variations within the humans, I mean, we are different, right? We all look different. We are different. different. Um, and I, I haven't actually looked into eye shape and, and what advantage it would have to be one shape versus the other so i don't i can't okay. really answer that one for you Sorry. from what i've heard about that anthony it's uh, i mean now granted all the explanations are just soaked through with with older you know long ages and, and mm. so yeah but they i think they think that during the last ice age as the, the thing the, from the sun glaring the, the glaciers the move south and the populations moved out of Africa and over to Asia, that the the eyes change shape to, to deal with the wind and sun glare and stuff on the glaciers. Okay. Um and then I remember reading a couple of years ago that through through uh through their study of DNA and genetics, they were able to determine that all human beings did in fact come from two particular people right like is that i think that was well, actually established yeah there's actually a really interesting twist to that um that that uh so you get your y chromosome from your father so only men have y chromosomes so we can trace a y chromosome lineage and they've actually traced it back to a single lineage and they named that lineage y chromosome adam um so then they regretted naming it Y chromosome. Yeah, of course I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you can trace your lineage back to Y chromosome Adam. And all men on the face of the earth are only 500 mutations removed from Y chromosome Adam. And at I, the rate of mutation that we observe in human beings, that would take at most 10,000 years. That's funny. And uh, contrast that. So hold on to that for a second. And then contrast that with um, the, the difference between the chimp and the human Y chromosome. They're so different that the researchers who discovered that they were only about 35% similar um, said that that's the difference they would expect to see between birds and humans, not chimps and humans. Wow. So, so our Y chromosomes are that different from chimps, but they're so incredibly close to each other. That well, tells so, me somebody, that we can't have evolved. 
from chimps. That by itself tells you we can't have evolved from chimps because we can't be that similar to each other and that different from them at the same time with the same mutation rates. Somebody pointed out just how different men are from women. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, we're about 98% the same. Look how different we are. Um, Um, uh, Hard Knock Life wants to know, uh, why do... uh, what? Why do Italians talk with their hands so much? Is there a genetic? I don't know because I'm not Italian and I also talk with my hands. So. Definitely genetic entropy. That's, we, uh... we do we do have some uh, audience uh, questions. Uh, well, hold on, hold on though. Okay, go ahead. So you say all men can trace back to one one Y chromosome, one, one oh, yes. y chromosome women, line, but right? women, women can trace to three, right? Yes. yes, three mitochondrial lines. Why? Well, there was Noah and his three sons. And his son's three wives. So women that are alive today don't get their mitochondria from Noah's wife. They get their mitochondria from one of Noah's son's wives. And that's why there's three mm. different lines. It seems like the more we learn, the more the biblical narrative is confirmed, mm-hmm. but they don't like to actually talk about these no. things. It's uh, no, not at all. I know pretty- I, I've I've heard though that the mito- mitochondrial lines they think go back further in time though than the y chromosome line is that am i right with that so it that depends on your the mutation clocks and the mutation rates in the mitochondria are going to be different than the mutation rates in the y chromosome so you know and again it's the whole is the mutation rate now the same as it was then is it but they 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 come to within the same window of it like an order in the same order of magnitude so even even with the the evolution taking the evolutionist um you know dating methods into account so that that doesn't that doesn't really raise a lot of questions for me at all just because um the the some people date them within the same window some people date them within slightly different windows and and you know of course whenever you date anything in in biology you're going to get actually a range of dates um, this is especially true with radiometric dating, um, but it's also true with molecular clocks because we don't know how fast the mutation rate is and we don't know if it was constant. Um, so if you get a range of dates, then you're going to pick the date that actually fits the theory that you're operating with. So you don't want to pick the date that's going to be the same as the Y chromosome atom. You want to pick a, any date that's different, right? Because Good point. Yeah. 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 Just one more way that they can twist it around a little bit to not make it confirm the, the story we all know is true. Rob, you have a couple of the uh, audience questions, right? Yeah. Um, let's see here. What do you think about the theory of evolution being aligned with Newtonian physics versus quantum physics? I'm not sure what they're pushing at there. I'm not sure. I'm not really sure either. And because I don't know anything about quantum physics, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. I don't even think quantum physicists know much about quantum physics, to be quite <laughs> honest with fair. you. I think that's fair. The The only people who claim to know something about quantum physics are people who think that homeopathy is real and want to justify it using some sort of science. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, uh, so this goes back to, I think, you know, the protein and DNA question. Mm-hmm. Do they continue to just ignore the, that problem or do they try to explain it away with some sort of theory? So the theory, uh, if we're going back to like sort of the origins of, of molecular life, um, I'm sorry, I'm shifting around here, but I'm starting to have some pain in my, my bad ankle. But um, the, the, the theory is that everything started with RNA, which even as a graduate student, I was like, well, that theory is baloney because RNA is one of the most fragile molecules that, that is uh, biologically important. Um, unless, of course, you put some weird caps on it and, and bioengineer it and then put it in lipid nanoparticles, but that's okay. Um, so it's pretty fragile in its natural state. And if you're talking about, you know, some sort of warm little pond scenario where you have, you, you have like electric current, you know, causing these, these molecules to, or these atoms to hook together in a correct way to form biologically, biologically relevant molecule, you're talking about a pretty violent um, chemical soup. And that's just not an area where RNA would survive. And um, the experiments that have been done supposedly demonstrating that you can get, you know, a simple self-replicating RNA that will, that will, that will make copies of itself and those copies will mutate. And then you, you have evolution of the RNA over time. Curiously enough, I'll start with 
precisely designed RNA by some researcher that has the ability, prepossesses the ability to self-replicate. They don't just start with, you know, carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen and, you know, phosphorus and say, okay, now we've gotten somehow to a self-replicating RNA. So even, even things that are supposed to demonstrate this, this could be tenable are not particularly tenable. And so they really don't have a way. They, they want the RNA world hypothesis to work, but there's so many reasons that it just doesn't. And there's a, there's a lot of evidence on all that chemical evolution stuff. There's a great book called Stairway to Life by Change Laura Tan and Rob Statler. And they go through 10 different steps that you would have to take to go from uh, chemicals to, to biology and show how every single one of them is untenable. Do you find yourself like screaming at your TV sometimes when you see certain things? Because like, I was going to say, but internal articles, but yes, <laughs> there's, there's just, so, it's so frustrating to see how many lies are told. So, uh, what else we got? Um, so this one just came in. Um, why, if, if we can do the women through the mitochondrial line back to, to th three separate lines, mm -hmm. why can't we, if well, they all exactly. came from Eve originally, why can't we? Trace it back there. Because we're missing all of the data between Eve and Noah. Almost like there was a big flood or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're missing all the data between Eve and Noah, you can't you can't coalesce those three back into one because you just have three that are very different from each other and you don't have any connections in between them. Three that presumably came from different mothers themselves. So mm -hmm. okay, right. yeah. Um well, okay, that one was easy. Ham might have been with Noah's wife, so we don't <laughs> <laughs> you mean his mom? <laughs> yeah. Um that's actually the the uncovered yes. his father's nakedness. Some of the theories are that that means Yeah, I don't think that's <laughs> Some people yeah, some people don't think that. But yeah. Oh, okay. Um so this one is more just there might not be any science to this one at all, but what are your thoughts on the Nephilim? I don't have any thoughts on the Nephilim. Sorry. Darn. I do. <laughs> I, I try I try very hard to stay in my lane and especially oh. if I'm giving some sort of public presentation, which this is obviously on the internet. So, you know, there's a lot of people that are going to see this and right. I can't really comment on something that I actually, you know, you don't want to hurt the credibility you have. Yeah. No. yeah that's why, no, that's why no. we but I also don't want to mislead people, you know, like yeah. my, my personal private theories on some sort of esoteric thing. That's like not really my field is, is not really something I want to talk about. A Anthony, you should be taking notes. Uh, no, I comment on every <laughs> single thing, but I tell, I, I tell everyone, I'm a high school dropout. Don't take anything I say seriously. You guys have no degrees. I'm just a dumb guy that says what's on his mind. Um, <laughs> let's see. Are uh, you Pamela, familiar oh. with, uh, Stephen Meyer's work about evolution and how the timelines don't work? I'm familiar with, uh, Stephen Meyer. I'm not familiar with the specific, uh, the timeline not working. So I'm not sure what's being referenced there. Um, Did you see his appearance on Joe Rogan? No, I don't watch Joe Rogan. Well, I, I watched that episode specifically because he, he went on and he challenged okay. all, like the whole purpose for him going on was to challenge evolution. Wow. There's a very interesting episode. He, mm -hmm. he really, it's funny to watch people, um, especially a guy like Joe Rogan, because he's constantly talking about how uh, people that have religion are just uh, so, so biased towards what they want. And then when any of his ideas were challenged, it was, you saw him get unnerved. Yeah. When St Stephen Meyer started to challenge some of these things saying, no, nah, actually evolution is not what you think it is. And it was, it was yeah. a pretty good episode. Well, see, Joe Rogan is correct that people who, who have a somewhat nonsensical belief system get, you know, really been out of shape when you challenge them, but he doesn't realize that he's talking about his own party. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said, somebody said the other day, um, I don't, I don't, I can't trust anybody. I can't trust Christians because they believe the most ridiculous things and whatever. And I'm like, do you even think about what atheists, modern atheists believe these days? Like they believe yeah. the most insane things. Yeah ever um rob do we have any more audience questions so this one is kind of a, a specific one but i want to kind of uh general generalize it more they're they're talking about goosebumps possibly being uh a holdover you know from like a a, a, res a response our ancestors may have had mm -hmm. in general though like without uh evolution are we still able to explain 
some of these things like goosebumps or other things that may be responses that that our human ancestors may have had to have had whereas we don't necessarily yeah, while we that. were hunter gatherers and well, things like that when I mean, there were goosebumps like not when you're afraid but but as a general thing goosebumps are a temperature regulation mechanism right so they actually alter your body temperature well when you get afraid you have hormones that are released that control all kinds of things about what's going on in your body, your digestion, your circulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It stands to reason that your blood, your, your body temperature would also be an important part of that because if you're mm. going into fight or flight. You're going to have to put, you know, all of your available resources into fighting or fleeing. So if there's something about, you know, raising goosebumps that alters your body temperature in a way that's favorable to fighting or fleeing, then there's absolutely no reason why that would have to be an evolutionary leftover because the goosebump part of it is regulating body temperature. That's a normal mechanism. And then when you have this flood of adrenaline, adrenaline affects everything that's going on in your mm -hmm. body. Why wouldn't it affect your temperature? Regulation? And it's still relevant to us today. It doesn't yeah. need to be a holdover. Um, yeah. Rob, ask Joey's question. This is my brother I, I was, Joey asked this. That's a really gonna, good question. Um, so let's forget about the morality or the theology of it. Sure. But um, if, you know, Adam and Eve had, had two sons originally, then whatever it eventually right. at some point incest would have had to have happened to grow the human population mm -hmm. why nowadays can incest produce such terrible defects yeah. whereas it seems like in the the beginning they, it maybe did not do so well the answer to that is also genetic entropy because it actually wasn't that long ago that cousins could get married lawfully um mm -hmm. and you know we think that's like disgusting and weird but um it, it actually wasn't considered disgusting and weird that long ago. And it didn't actually produce immediate harm that long ago. In fact, most of Europe's rural population is related to each other at the time of World War One. You know, they were they were cousins fighting cousins. Um, so, you know, that when we're talking about Noah, we're talking about somebody, you know, over 4000 years ago, if my my memory is serving correctly around 4000 years ago, you know, that's 4000 years less mutations that's that's a hundred mutations every generation we have so many more mutations now that if you are if you are if you were to produce offspring with someone who is too related to you the number of negative mutations that you both carry that overlap would be so dramatic that you would see birth defects so and you wouldn't have seen that when when noah was living or you certainly wouldn't have seen it with adam and eve because adam and eve started with basically perfect genomes mm. You know, because they didn't they didn't suffer from millions of years of mutation prior to, you know, coming into existence, whereas we've suffered from thousands of years of mutation, you know, that's all been passed along to us by our parents. And Noah hadn't actually. So when you think about the fact that these patriarchs lived as long as they lived, there weren't as many generations between Adam and Noah as we think there should have there would have been given the number of years just because they were so long lived. So he was fairly genetically perfect compared to us okay. and his kids would have been too. So as time goes on, the human species will have to probably even get more strict about maybe not third, meeting second with and third second, cousins, third and, cousins yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Um, can Pam, can Pamela use the bacteria reproduction rate and how it is a good example for debunking evolution, mutation and speciation? Um, yeah, I can take, talk a little bit about that. So if bacteria reproduce about every 20 minutes in the laboratory, um, you multiply that, you know, the number of, of generations that you'd get in a year already is pretty astronomical um, because you're going to have, what is that? It's 24 hours in a day, you know, three generations in an hour. That'd be 72 so, generations in a day times 365. You know, I'm not doing that math in my head, but <laughs> um and that's a lot of generations in a year. And we've been mutating bacteria for about a, over a hundred years now. I mean, we started, they started mutating flies in Morgan's fly room in 1904, you know? So um, we've been mutating flies for a really long time. We've been mutating bacteria for a really long time. We've had many, 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 many generations. If we were going to see speciation, we should have seen it by now because between the generation number and the mutation rate that we've sped up, we have, we've sort of accelerated the, the, um, what you would see in nature in terms of that that uh, accumulation of mutations 
And we still don't even, you can't even get a new species of bacteria. You just get a different strain of the same species of bacteria. So it happens to be an E. coli that can't produce lactose or an E. coli that, you know, can't, you know, can't process citrate or something like that. You know, it's not even, it, it, and eat something else, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not even, well, even, even the primordial sludge that they supposedly think everything came from. We could never reproduce that primordial sludge that they no. like, there's no way for life. They all, I, I think they even say, give us one miracle. Yeah. You need a miracle. I mean, you can't, no matter Why how you slice take it. Take the ones that God told us that he did. There, I mean, there that, the, if you need a miracle, if you need a miracle and you, then you need a miracle giver, right? Mm -hmm. And so why don't you just trust the giver of miracles when he said he did what he said he did? Because people don't want to be told what to do in the bedroom. Yeah, that is it. That is actually all it is. People, it, I think so much of the not one, so much of the atheist cope, so much of the, it, it all comes down to don't tell me what to do in, in the pelvic sure. area. Because you find so few people who will say treat others as you want to be treated is not okay. You'll find so few people who will say thou shalt not steal is bad or thou shalt not kill is bad. All these things, they're all fine with all of the all of the commands of God, except the ones that tell them that they should not be promiscuous. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to that. So uh, before we uh, plug the Colby Center, um, what was the biggest, uh, what was like the 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 biggest one that that when you realized they were lying to you about you were just like are you kidding me with that is there anything that stands out to you or am i putting you on the spot too much man um i i'll just pick one um and one of the ones that stands out to me the most actually is not even in my field it's it's the fact that the big bang theory can't actually explain the formation of a single planet in the solar system that's pretty good. That was, that was one of the biggest, like, like, wait, 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 what? Like every single planet you have to invoke some sort of catastrophe for how, how it happened. It, it didn't happen by the, the normal method of planet formation that you're theorizing. Um, but th that probably seemed more remarkable to me because I know less about the field, you know, so. Well, Pamela. Okay. So let's, let's make sure we plug the Colby center. You guys actually do have to, um, we, we need to get some money to the Colby center because we want to make sure Pamela stays there. Um, I, I hope you had fun with us tonight, Pamela. This is I had a great really, time. Yes, thank yeah, you. this is a really fun episode for us. You know, it's, it's been a, a journey for me over the past few months of just a lot of, like you're saying about the, the planet creation thing for me, it was Hugh, Hugh explaining how, just the their method of they just make it as if things have always been the same mm -hmm. and really grasping that concept that mm -hmm. their every single judgment they make requires them to say it's over millions of years in order for this all to work because they say oh it's just always been like this mm -hmm. and it's when you understand that that's not like if if the flood happened that that's gonna mess up if, if there's right. a worldwide flood that yep, that messes theory, up all your calculations <laughs> every single calculation you could possibly have so and saint peter says in the later days they will deny the flood right. and things like that so i mean we're really living in in that time right now so okay so how yep. can we help with the colby center yeah. So, um, yeah, that's there, there's the link right there. Um, Colby center.org donate. Um, so there are only three full-time employees at the Colby center currently, um, myself, Mr. Owen and, uh, Keith, who's does all of our camera stuff and, uh, all the videos that you see that we produce. Um, normally I'd be recording from his basement right now. He's desperately working on finishing day two of how the world was made. So pray for that and, uh, yeah. and pray for us in general, just for the spiritual and financial support. We need to keep doing what we're doing because, um, you know, unfortunately being biological, I still have to eat. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, <laughs> being in the internet age, I still have to, to be connected to the internet and have, have a, a light and a, and a microphone. Um, so currently we have only about three quarters of what it's going to take to employ me full time next year. And we're hoping to raise some additional donations between now and the end of the year. And so if you are able to go to that link and, um, make a donation specifically uh, for the work that I do. So just leave a little note that this this donation is for Pamela Acker. Mr. Owen will know uh, to keep me on board. So um, well, I'm going to I'm going to say this. Our audience is extremely generous. They always are. Anytime we come to they really are. So so don't let us down, everyone. 
Yeah, well, we had <laughs> we had Michael Hitchborn on last week, and we talked about just how hard it is to know what what you can give your money to because of all oh, the yeah. shady things going on in the church right now. Mm -hmm. Guys, we're all called to tithe, every one of us, and I'm not hitting you with the uh, uh, prosperity gospel. I'm just telling you, we're all called to tithe, right. and there's good things you can give your money to, and I honestly, the Colby Center has changed my entire paradigm on the creation of the world these past few months. So if you guys can, please give something to them. Um, Pamela, I hope you come back on with us. This is really fun. <laughs> Thank you. I'd love to. Yeah. So, yeah. That would okay. be great. Is there anything else you want to promote or it's just that? Well, I also, um, so we set up a give, send, go account for me. So if you go to give, send, go and type in Pamela Acker, you can find that. Um, so either way, the donation still goes to the same place. So if you donate there, then the Colby center doesn't have to raise as much money. And if you donate to the Colby center, then I don't have to raise as much money. So okay. we're, we're all good. Those are the, those are, are, the are there any, um, are there any good talks that you've given that you think that we could point people to? Maybe people yes, want to go a little deeper. Actually, than so on a slightly different topic, um, there is a talk that I gave at bringing America back to life in Cleveland, uh, a couple years ago. Um, that link might be a little bit more difficult to find. So I'll see if I can grab it for you and land it in the chat here while I'm talking. Um, uh, I gave a talk at that conference on the connection between abortion and vaccines. And it really just looked at the history of it. It's, it's, um, I mean, I couldn't give the talk without crying. So you probably won't be able to listen to the talk without crying. Um, because it, it, the whole situation there with abortion and pharmaceuticals really is, it really is more horrific than we, than we yeah. even, even think about. So, um, that's a talk that I would really direct people to. There's a number of talks on census fidelium that I've yeah, done that on, on creation and evolution. So the Steve just recorded us out in, um, Charlotte, uh, Mr. O and I were in Charlotte in, uh, in September. So those are the most recent ones. And, um, and then we're working on getting last year's conference talks up on, um, on our website as well. So between census fidelium and the website, but the talk that I gave in September, uh, in Charlotte at, um, at, uh, is, uh, is that the icons of evolution one? Yeah, there's an icons of evolution one, but there's one on genetic entropy. That's actually, that really is the nail in the coffin. It's absolutely the nail in the coffin to, to the whole evolution hoax um, because the genetics just don't support it. And if their, if their mechanism is mutation plus natural selection, and we can show that that actually doesn't lead to the development of anything new and only leads to decline, then there's, there's really kind of nothing else to say. Yeah, guys, I, th I don't, I don't think people realize how important of an issue this is. If, if people if if people believe the story of evolution it gives them an out in their conscience it, it every really is every terrible man. ideology over the last 200 years has evolution at its beginning and core mm -hmm. yeah there's a reason they're trying to indoctrinate our children with this stuff it's because if you can even this is this is what gives your conscience an out for mm -hmm. every woman who walks into uh, an AB clinic, every one of them, it all comes down to, well, we're just an accident. We're not that important. Mm -hmm. There's nothing special about us when the complete opposite is the truth. Like God created each and every one of us and he knew us from before he formed us in the womb. And I think really, if you, if you buy the lies of evolution and you're, and you're, you're, um, your protology is off. Your eschatology will be off too. You yeah. won't understand how Christ will come again in power and glory to judge the living and the dead. You won't realize how significant that is if you don't understand how significant the earth and the world and everything being created the way God says that he created it. So please go to the Colby Center, guys. Pamela, we hope that you come back on with us. We will be back on Tuesday. Rob, do we have anybody for Tuesday? Um, no, we have nobody for Tuesday. Next Thursday is the return of Nick Cavazos. And then we have um, we have Anthony Stein and Matt Gaspers coming up to do a 2023 year in review. That's going to be a fun show. So, um Pamela, thank you so much. This was really fun. You you were very yeah. easy to talk to and very informative. <laughs> so we'll definitely get you back on. This is a good time. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.
All right, um, Rob, take before, it down. Hold on. Before we go, I just want to copy this link Pamela sent and put it in the chat here. Thanks. Oh, I also, guys, I forgot to do that. the ad read tonight, but mycatholicwill.com. <laughs> You're the worst. AB20. You're the worst. <laughs> I am telling you. really you are. Um, look, we're talking about genetic entropy and everybody dying. <laughs> like, guys, every one of us are going to die. And I know some family members yeah, that, passed, that passed on it, without having a will filled out, and it is quite enough. And according to Pamela, it's all coming to an end pretty soon. It's all coming <laughs> to an end very soon, guys. Um, I, I don't have the uh, I don't have the um, the ad read to even give their disclaimer, but they're not lawyers, guys. That's all I can tell you. This is you know. Right. But if you go to mycatholicwill.com, uh, put in code AB20. I'll do a proper ad read on Tuesday's show. Pamela, thank you so much. Rob, take us out, brother. Oh <laughs> my gosh.